I would like to, yes, <laughs> just a moment. Yeah, okay, okay, that works. Okay, now uh, I would like to open the uh, research part of the um, symposium, and uh, I need to mention one thing. Uh, due to uh, low clouds yesterday, uh, we had some flight cancellations, and uh, some of the morning speakers were not able to make it on time. They will uh, report here uh, later. Uh, so for that reason, we changed the schedule a little bit. So don't be surprised uh, finding it's not in order, but uh, it's just minor change uh, so far. And um, also, I would like to acknowledge the generous contribution of our sponsors, uh, OVPR, um, uh, Center for Research in Photonics, and uh, Toptica, and uh, Oz Optics. Um, also, um, Euridian Spectral Technology and RTIC Photonics. Um, without your contributions, uh, we would not be able to run such a successful event. Thank you very much. Uh, so, our next, yes, <laughs> they deserve applause. Our next speaker is um, uh, uh, Professor Miles Paget uh, from the University of Glasgow. Sorry. Okay, right, a bit confusing. Never mind. Uh, happy birthday, Bob. Um, I should just say uh, it, was, it was British irony. It wasn't really Bob that stole the painting. The, 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 the real culprit was, wasn't. Well, sorry, someone's taken the fall for it. <laughs> that wasn't you. So the, anyway, right. So I'm just going to say a few words this morning about a paper that, uh, that Bob and I uh, published recently. And, of course, I'm going to say many other things in terms of, Bob, thank you very much for your friendship and guidance and enthusiasm for physics over all of the years. And, uh, do you know, there's, there's lots of people that are cleverer than me and that know more about stuff than me. But every now and again, you come across people that really understand something in their very, very core. You know, almost like they don't have to have learnt it, they don't have to have read about it. They just understand the way things are. And when it comes to quantum optics and nonlinear optics in particular, you know, in all the world, that, that person is Bob. Somehow he, he wakes up in the morning and he smells the right answer. And uh, um, I, I wish I knew how to do that too. So anyway, I'm going to say a few little words about Bob. But first of all, the Glasgow strap line is inspiring people. Ta da! Bob is an inspiring person, so I'll uh, just add that up there. Now, um, don't worry, the talk starts for real soon. We've been seeing pictures. Many years ago, Bob came to our house, and, and at that time, my daughter Jenna, I don't know how old she was, maybe six or something, and we played on the Wii together. And uh, Jenna made Bob an avatar so Bob could be his own person. And so I just, I, I rang up last night and said, quick, 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 turn it back on again and see whether the Bob avatar is still in our library. So isn't that just an incredibly good likeness of Bob? I think uh, there's no question that you look at that and go, which one is Bob? Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure which one I am, actually. I think, I think sadly, it's, that's me there. Less, somewhat less flattering, anyway. So let's keep going on. So the, the, the Boyd Back catalogue, um, and I just went on to Google Scholar yesterday and thought I'd put down the, the four papers near the top of the screen relating to ghost imaging and, and quantum imaging that Bob has put together. And um, I think the really key thing for me in Bob's contribution to this field is really summed up by this paper here. I love this paper here. Um, demonstrating beautifully how many of the attributes that one associated with a quantum ghost imaging system could be repeated classically. And I think that was a, an extremely important contribution to the field. And I'm going to say a few words now 
just about this paper on the left-hand side that, um, that Bob and I wrote with our co-authors, many of them in Glasgow, but also Ottawa, about the resolution limits of, of, of ghost imaging. Um, so, what do I want to say? So I'm going to start off with our down conversion crystal. My photons come in, and of course, if I could look at the photons in the far field, I would see that the positions of the photons are anti-correlated, i.e. the momentum is anti-correlated. If one photon goes a little bit to the left, the other one goes a little bit to the right. And therefore, if I measure the photons in one of those two beams, the position, I know the position of the photon in the other beam without ever actually having to measure it. And I guess the question there is, is that prediction, is that correlation perfect or is it not perfect? To what extent can that correlation go beyond the correlation that you might anticipate from, from classical physics? And so the notion of ghost imaging is simply this, that one of those photons illuminates the object, the other photon goes off to a position measuring detector, let's call it a camera, uh, the first thing all I need to know is does the photon go through the object, yes or no? So that bucket detector collects all the transmitted photons, simply tells me yes, it was transmitted. If it was transmitted, I either post-select or correlate with the other position of the other photon. So all the position information comes from the camera even though those photons have never interacted with the camera. Of course, they never looked like that quite in reality. That's a, a lab bench showing one such setup. And so the question really there is what sets the resolution of that imaging system? So let's look at it again a little bit more uh, uh, carefully this time. I've got a UV pump beam coming into the nonlinear crystal. It's an extended beam, it's a large beam. Uh, the down conversion diverted light from that crystal occupies many, many, many different spatial modes. Signal goes off to the left, idler goes off to the right, and we see that the object is placed in the far field of the crystal, the camera is placed in the far field of the crystal, and because they're in the far field, then they are anti-correlated, and the image that one obtains is an inverted, geometrically inverted image an upside down image, no argument so far. Now what is it <coughs> that actually controls those, um, those, the strength of that correlation? So if I think about the pump photon coming forwards, my idle and signal photons going in left and right, momentum is conserved. And so you think it's sort of the pump is bisecting perfectly. But let's not forget the pump beam is finite in extent and therefore there is an uncertainty in the transverse momentum of the pump photon and it's that uncertainty in the transfer, on the transverse momentum of the pump photon which essentially causes these two photons, you can think about them as sort of wobbling from side to side and therefore even though I've measured this one I don't quite know where the other one is. And so that maps through quite simply into the strength of the correlation is given by the size of the pump beam. The bigger the pump beam, the tighter the correlation, the higher the resolution that one might expect to get. Is that actually true? So let's think now in terms of the Klitschko back projection model where I replace one of my detectors with a light source and now my photon leaves the light source, goes through the object, goes back to the crystal, but the crystal is now a mirror, and then it's essentially reflected from the mirror to form an inverted imaging system. And one can see, in a sense, that this mirror is in the far field of the object, and the size of the mirror effectively sets the range of spatial frequencies that can be relayed. And if I make the mirror smaller, it's like introducing a spatial filter into the imaging system, and my image will become blurred, so when I replace my nonlinear crystal with my mirror, how big should the mirror be? Well, the answer is the mirror should be the size of the pump beam. And so it's the diameter of the pump beam which is effectively setting the physical size of the spatial filter. 
and that is what's setting the resolution of the imaging system. So let's see whether that's really true. And so here we've built up a different, slightly different ghost imaging system. It's the same as before, other than the camera is re-imaged to there. So why have we introduced an extra image plane to the system? And the reason for that is, is I want to be able to compare the object being placed in, so let's call it the ghost imaging position, to the object being placed in essentially another image plane, but one here where all you're really doing is using the down-converted light as just a simple illumination system, which one may or may not choose to herald with the other beam. Now, in that situation, I think it's pretty clear that the field of view that one gets, the, 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 the size of the light spot in the far field is to do with the divergence of light from the crystal, which scales with the square root of the crystal length, and that the resolution in this system is not set with anything to do with the crystal at all. The resolution in this system is absolutely set by the size of the lens which is doing the imaging. And so in this situation here, the resolution of my system is set by the resolving power of the optical system of that lens effectively, the, the diameter of that lens. And so I can now think about playing around with the pump beam size and seeing how that changes. So I now make a small pump beam. Well, actually, I've not changed anything to do with my traditional imaging system. The resolution is still set by the size of the lens. Nothing is going to change. However, if I now revert to the ghost imaging position, I've effectively introduced an additional spatial filter. And you see what happens? The image becomes blurred. It becomes blurred because the small pump beam has acted as a spatial filter acting on the imaging system within the Klitschko model. So that's what one thinks should happen. Is it actually what happens? And so here's some beautiful results uh, actually from Paul. And uh, you can see on the top row, that's just the normal imaging system where the object and the camera are in the same arm and I'm essentially just using the down-converted light to illuminate the object. And in that situation, it does not matter how large or small the pump beam is. You can see that the left-hand image, the middle image, and the right-hand image, albeit slightly different brightnesses, are actually the same resolution. On the contrary, once I put the object in the other arm and we're doing a ghost imaging system, then as I reduce the size of the pump beam, I degrade the resolving power of the ghost imaging system. So, indeed, ghost imaging, quantum ghost imaging, is effectively governed by all the same rules, restrictions, and limitations in terms of resolution as a classical imaging system. And so I just want to summarize the conclusion of that paper. And one is considering, you know, what would happen if I restrict the dimensions or the aperture of various components in my imaging system? What happens if I restrict the diameter of a lens? Well, if I restrict the diameter of any lens in the system, then I degrade the resolving power. That's true of both classical and quantum. What happens if I restrict the diameter of the pump beam? Well, that acts as a spatial filter. That was also very sad. Actually, the only place where I can arbitrarily stick in an aperture without degrading the resolution is that space between the object and the bucket detector. Because all the bucket detector was trying to do was measure the, whether light was transmitted or not. Now clearly, and that's why I've got a little smiley face next to that aperture, clearly there's still a problem in that I would lose signal and the image would get dark, but it wouldn't actually degrade in its resolution. So um, I think I've probably spoken for long enough. So thank you very much, Bob, for all the inspiration that you have provided to me, my, my students, my colleagues in, in Glasgow and beyond over the years. And I look forward to many, 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 many more years being further inspired by you in the future. So thank you very much. So, in case if anybody has any questions, uh, please raise your hand. Yes, please. Samuel. Uh, 
Would you please comment on the very good by the way, thank you. Uh, would you please comment on the, the wavelength? So for instance, the signal and fiber can be a different wavelength. How do we um, do these scale as we expect from the exact a conventional imaging system? So Bob uh, Bob and I have indeed published a different uh, paper. Oh, yes. Okay. So the question was, how does the um, how does the resolution of a ghost imaging system depend upon the wavelength of the signal and idler light, particularly in the situation when the signal and idler are non-degenerate, and essentially I have one infrared beam and one. Um, um, and one visible beam. And um, sa sadly, in, in that situation, and I can't, I can't quite prove it to you, and I can't point a paper, maybe there's a paper there waiting. There's, there's three resolutions I would say to consider. One is the fidelity by which the signal beam is relayed from the crystal to the, um, let's say, the camera. Um, and that has like just classical diffraction limit constraints. The other is the fidelity by which the idler beam is relayed from the crystal to the object, again, through a lens system. And one again, one can see that there are natural diffraction limits to that. And in the case of the quantum imaging, there's a third situation, which is the underlying strength of the correlation between the signal and the idler, which in the far field is set by the diameter of the pump beam. Now, as far as we can tell with the results that we have, yes, you may, in the case of a very, very, very large pump beam, acquire an extremely strong correlation between the signal and idler in the plane of the crystal. However, if you then measure it in the far field, the strength of the correlation as measured is limited by the classical resolving power of the optical system with which you tried to image it. And so all of that rather sadly means if you go for a wildly non-degenerate ghost imaging system, the resolution of the images that you get will be dictated by the fidelity by which you can image the infrared light from the crystal effectively onto the object. And so, I, I, sadly, I don't think in this, tar, in this form of ghost imaging where one photon goes through the object and the other photon goes directly to the detector, I don't think there's any resolution advantage to be had by using a down conversion source. Now, the slides that I didn't show, we can talk about them later, uh, I was going to show some new work where we pass both photons through the object, so both the signal and idler photon pass through the object. And in that situation, I think you can, well, uh, uh, if you believe our results, and indeed the work of others, you, would, you can get certainly a route two improvements in the, the diffraction limit in terms of the, um, the, the, the width of the point spread function. Thank you very much, Miles, uh, for the wonderful talk.